so we're now going to whip through the rest of the telencephalic function, the cerebral f cortex function. Um, and we're going to start with looking at some sensory motor uh, cortex. So as I said before, here's the sylvian fissure, and there's a, uh, a central sulcus that uh, comes up from it all the way to the uh, top that separates the parietal lobe from the frontal lobe. And in the front of it is the motor cortex, and the back of it is the this, is this, uh, somatosensory cortex. And both of these areas give rise to corticospinal tract neurons and corticobulbar tract neurons. So they both, maybe more from motor cortex, but plenty from uh, somatosensory cortex. And so they, they uh, are collectively called sensor, part of sensory motor cortex. In addition, uh, the motor cortex is, is more of an executor than it is a, uh, the boss. It really likes to take uh, instructions from other places. And so there are two really important areas, the supplementary uh, motor area and the premotor cortex that are just in front of, uh, of motor cortex. And, and I've, I've illustrated that. I, I recognize that this is an extremely ugly brain and I drew it very poorly. But the idea being, if this is the central sulcus, the gyrus right behind it is somatosensory cortex, the gyrus in front of it is motor cortex, then there's the supplementary motor area, premotor cortex. Now, there are three more places that we're gonna look at. One, I didn't mention this, but I don't know if you noticed, that when we looked at the motor map, uh, actually, we didn't look at the motor map. When you look, at, when you look at the motor map, what you will realize that the motor cortex has no map of the extraocular muscles. It has no map of of how to move your eyes. And in fact, motor cortex does not move your eyes. It's pretty interesting that eye movement is is relegated to a different part of cortex in the frontal lobe. It's called the frontal eye fields. And the frontal eye fields are responsible for turning your gaze to the other side. So the frontal eye fields are responsible for turning gaze contralaterally. So if there were a lesion here, what you would, what you would lose is the, mo let's say you had a complete lesion. This doesn't happen too often, but let's say you had a complete lesion of the motor strip. You would lose the ability to move the, um, uh, the face and the arm and the hands on the other side, and you would also lose the ability to look to the other side. Because you lose the ability to look to the other side, at rest, your eyes will be deviated towards the same side. So if you see somebody who at rest, instead of looking straight ahead, which is the normal, which is the norm, uh, they are looking to the side, that is the side of the lesion because they've lost the ability to look to the other side. So they're looking to the affected side. Okay, so that's frontal eye field. Um, and frontal eye field uh, lesions are common and, the, and understanding uh, where resting gaze is is a very useful cue to figure out what side a lesion is on. Okay, another, another p uh, important uh, motor piece is, is what's called Broca's area. I think the use of Broca's area is, is probably out of fashion now, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's an easier name than, than describing this anatomically. So we'll, we'll go with Broca's area. Broca's area is, remember that the topography of the motor strip is from uh, legs, trunk, arms, head. So it's right in front of the head area. That's how I think about it. So right in front of the head area is the area that is required for speech. Now, this is not just required for speech, it's actually required for language. What do I mean by that? If you have a lesion in the Broca's area and you, you are a native signer, you, communicate, you have communicated by sign language from birth, then you will lose the ability to sign. So this is a deficit in language production, not necessarily speech production. It's a very important point. Um, and just to, to, to pr 
presage what, what, what we'll get into later is this is Wernicke's area. It's back in the temporoparietal junction, and this is responsible for language comprehension. The, e even when we include Broca's area, frontal eye fields, premotor cortex, supplementary motor area, it still doesn't answer the question of what we're going to do or whether we're going to do anything. Why not just lie on the couch all day? Why not? Well, there is nothing stopping you except for your prefrontal cortex. Your prefrontal cortex is going to be the, the area of your brain that's going to make you get up and go to work every day or is going to make you um, not go to work every day, uh, skip work or skip school. Uh, so the prefrontal cortex is the, is the area where you make your priorities and you use them to drive your affect and your motivation. When there are lesions in the prefrontal cortex, we lose our normal style of initiative. And there are, are two stories here that are, are, are useful. One is the story of Phineas Gage. Now, Phineas Gage uh, was a foreman on a uh, railroad team building a railroad, and they have to use explosives, and there's a, a tamping iron, which is a very, very tall, very heavy iron pole, which uh, was driven by ex explosives through his prefrontal cortex. It was driven... Uh, kind of like this. So it went in, it, he lost vision in one eye, and it went out. And pretty much what was affected was uh, the prefrontal cortex, everything that's not, frankly, somatomotor cortex. So everything out here is all prefrontal cortex. Um, so the, the story is, and the story is, I, I, I think there's a good argument to make that the story is, is relatively apocryphal not frankly true. The story is that after this accident, Gage was no longer Gage. Uh, uh, and, and somebody actually said that, those words, and those are the most famous words from, from the case. In other words, before the accident, the uh, Phineas Gage was very popular. He was a foreman. People liked him. He had a, lo a rich social life. Uh, he, he did stuff, and, um, and everything was great. And afterwards, he no longer had friends. He couldn't socialize correctly, et cetera. Uh, that, that may have some truth to it. it. It may also have some falsehood to it. Regardless of whether the Phineas Gage story, per se, is 100% is accurate, it is absolutely true that prefrontal cortex is critical to our feeling of initiative. And the other place where we've learned this lesson, and we've learned it in a, in a most uh, difficult and painful way is through the introduction of lobotomies. This was initially uh, uh, introduced as a leucotomy uh, by Agas Moniz, a very, uh, I think, the most famous Portuguese neuroscientist. And he got the Nobel Prize for it back in, I believe, the 20s. It could have been the 30s. What's interesting about that as a sidelight is Egas Moniz also inv invented angiography. Angiography is a uh, technique that is used every day it, all over the world to study the cerebral vasculature. He did not get the Nobel Prize for that. He got the Nobel Prize for uh, inventing the leucotomy, which became in um, the United States through the efforts of Walter Freeman, the lobotomy, and has... Uh, is not, not, not a great contribution to science. So um, to, to put this into context and to, to uh, I don't want to vilify, I guess, my knees, the reason he developed this um, uh, approach was that at the time, for people that were uh, deemed to be mentally ill, they were depressed, they were schizophrenic, whatever the diagnosis was, the basic approach was to, uh, is, was to lock them up because there was nothing that could be done. And the, the, the few things that were done were, uh, were really quite extreme, such as putting them into an insulin shock, uh, basically taking them to the edge of death to try and get their system rebooted. So he, he was trying to make a, 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 um, 
a contribution here, trying to change things for the better. What he came up with was um, a, a, an operation where he came in here and he disconnected the prefrontal cortex from its connection to the thalamus. And, and, and he did this very carefully using a, a typical neurosurgical approach. When this, and it was, it was then adopted all over the world at, at the most prestigious institutions. Yale did it, Harvard did it, Johns Hopkins did it. All the universities adopted this, tried it out. One individual, Walter Freeman, adopted it and became a convert such that he no longer took in any, uh, any data. He no longer was a, um, was a open-minded scientist about it. He was a, he was a, um, evangelist essentially for lobotomies. Um, and moreover, Freeman changed the operation so that instead of doing this in a, in a, surgical theater, he actually used an ice pick and he went in through the orbit and he did it outpatient. He did it in his office. He, he, actually, he then made a bus that he would take around the, the country and invite people into the bus and do a lobotomy on them. So he'd go to a mental institution, a state mental institution, and do tens or maybe even a hundred in a, in a day. And he put in the ice pick through the orbit and he twirled it around. This is obviously not a controlled uh, operation. It's not a controlled activity at all. And the, out, the outcome of that was that uh, for most people was a disaster. For some people it was, um, it was not a complete disaster, uh, but for most people it was a complete disaster. And the, I, I, I won't go into, um, into this in great detail. I want to uh, highly recommend a, a few books that deal with this. So My Lobotomy is a book by Howard Dulley. Howard Dulley received a lobotomy at the age of, I believe, 12 uh, because his stepmother really found him uh, difficult to control. And so she asked Freeman to do it, and Freeman did it in a doctor's office. He went home with a black eye, was never the same. Luckily for Howard Dulley, he was young enough, um, and, and he's now been studied by people at UCSD. He's been imaged, and he was young enough that he made some recovery. So he's, he's got a reasonable life. Um, on the other hand, another individual who got a lobotomy was uh, Rosemary Kennedy, this was done at, uh, because jo Joseph Kennedy, his, her father, wanted it done. And uh, this book by Kate Clifford Larson called Rosemary is a very, uh, it's an amazing book. It's an amazing story. I had always thought that the lobotomy, uh, the lobotomy just undid her, killed her, so that it killed her essence. And what I found out from reading this book is that it didn't kill her so much as it made her completely aphasic and largely locked in. So she had a very difficult time communicating, but she was still in there. Her, her essence was still in there, and, it, and that becomes clear if you read the book. She, her personality shines through even as she has an incredibly difficult time communicating. Um, but the lobotomy completely disabled her uh, and most particularly her ability to, um, uh, to communicate. The Lobotomist is a book by Jack L. High that, that, uh, deal, that talks about, um, is a history of Walter Freeman and his, uh, his choices as he popularized and used the uh, lobotomy throughout the United States. And this book by Elliot Valenstein, Great and Desperate Cures, The Rise and Decline of Psychosurgery and Other Radical Treatments to Mental Illness is it's just a stupendous book that puts lobotomy into a broader context and, um, and has a lot of food for thought for modern uh, approaches to psychosurgery. So uh, we don't do lobotomies anymore, but there are uh, modern versions of psychosurgery. Uh, and uh, I think that it's the, these are th things that you, you should form your own opinions of. And these are books that can help you um, uh, be, become informed. 
Okay, in the final, in the final uh, video, what we're going to talk about is learning, memory, and intelligence.